Hey guys, welcome to a Science 14 lesson here. Today we are going to talk about solutions and solubility, solvents. We're going to get into talking about concentrations. So we got a whole bunch of different kind of things, but all going to feed back into solutions. So solutions. A solution is made when two or more substances combine to form a mixture that is uniform or looks the same throughout. So example, shampoo. There's a lot of different things inside of it, but it looks the same. Pop. I mean, there's a lot. If you look in the ingredients list, there's a lot of different things within pop, but it looks the same. A can of Coke is that dark color. Dishwashing detergent's the same. Syrup, vinegar. Vinegar, there's acid, there's water. A bunch of different things, and we're going to use vinegar later for experiments, but they all look the same. Now, when we talk about a solution, too, there are parts of the solution. There's a solute. And this is the substance that dissolves within the solution. So this is like putting sugar in water. When you put sugar in your water, you mix it around, it disappears. So that is the solute, the sugar. And the solvent is the substance in which the solute dissolves. So usually water, water is known as a universal solvent because, I mean, you put a lot of things in it. But it's usually it's a liquid of some sort. But for the most part, it's what makes the solute dissolve. So that's the solvent. Now concentrations. Concentrations describe the amount of solute in a solution. So concentrations are usually shown in G per L or known as grams per liter. So make sure you're aware of that. It's not kilograms per milliliter, it's grams per liter. Now example of this is Roundup. Roundup is a herbicide, so it's a plant killing chemical. Roundup is a solution of glyphosate or glio, sorry, glyphosate, ugh, glyphosate and water. The label says this product contains 7.0 grams per liter of glyphosate. Now this means that there are 7 grams of glyphosate in 1 liter of the product. Oh, sorry, I'm having a hard time saying that word. Bad day today. Anyways, now solubility. Solubility describes how easily a solute will dissolve in a solvent to make a solution. So when a substance will dissolve in a solvent, it is soluble. So example, sugar will dissolve, so disappear in water, so it is soluble. Soaps. Soaps dissolve in water to form a cleaning solution. And grease, for example, is not soluble in water, but in a soap solution it is. So grease would be insoluble, but within a soap water solution, it becomes soluble. So you think about putting uh, oil in water. It usually kind of sits on top. It's insoluble. It's not mixing together. However, if you have had a soap solution in there, it would be. Now, when a substance does not dissolve, it is insoluble, as I just said. An easy example would think like rocks. Rocks will not dissolve in water. Sorry, that's a little spelling mistake right there. So rocks will not dissolve, so won't disappear in water. So it is insoluble. Now, temperature affects insolubility. When a solute is added to a solvent, the energy associated with the solvent media generally breaks the bonds between the solute particles and separates them. So meaning the energy that's associated, so the energy that with the bonds of the solvent or solute that you put in there, so like the sugar, it's broken apart. Now in many cases this happens at room temperature, so sugar, common salt, they dissolve in water pretty easily. But if the energy of the solvent is not sufficient to break the bonds at room temperature, we have to provide extra energy for this purpose. So we have to apply a little something more to make sure we can break it down. So hence we heat. And the increase of temperature increases the solubility of substances. So if you were to put sugar in water, it would eventually I mean, disappear. You put it in hot water, it's going to disappear a lot faster because that energy from that heat there is going to break those bonds of that sugar a lot faster. And here's kind of just the uh, solubility of salt and sugar table. And we can see here, if you follow along in the mouse, as the temperature increases along the bottom here, the solubility of our sugar goes way up, so meaning that it breaks down way faster. Salt, on the other hand, it does break down, but not as much. Temperature doesn't affect it as much. It does a little bit, so you see we're, we're at just under 50 grams of solute dissolved, and we're getting closer to that mark. So here we're probably at 45, and we get to about 47. 
Now dilution. Dilution is a process of reducing the concentration of a solute in a solution, usually by mixing in more solvent. So example, you can add more water to concentrated orange juice to dilute it until it reaches a concentration that is pleasant to drink. So if you have a really kind of rich, kind of sour taste in orange juice, put more water in it, it's going to kind of blend it out a little more and be easier to drink. Or another example, pure oxygen. So pure oxygen is too rich for us to breathe for long for a long time, so leading to problems such, such as hyperoxia. In the air around us, oxygen is diluted naturally by the presence of nitrogen. And deep sea divers are harmed by nitrogen in the air because deep under the sea, gas pressures increase and at high pressures, nitrogen causes an agonizing condition in divers called the bends. For this reason, deep sea divers breathe oxygen diluted with helium rather than nitrogen. And our air around us actually has a high concentration of nitrogen and it, it dilutes the oxygen and makes it easier for us to breathe. If you ever watched uh, sports, especially playing in Denver, like the Denver Broncos who were just in the Super Bowl, teams that go play in Denver, because it's so high above the sea level, there isn't as much oxygen there. So the concentration of oxygen is lower. It's like if you climb a mountain, it's harder to breathe. Well, then you're fed pure oxygen, so it's easier to get some of that into your system. Now diluted products versus concentrated products. So concentrated products have a lot more solute per volume of solvent. So example, juice crystals. You have juice crystals in a package. So to make juice from the concentrate, you need to add the water. Whereas the diluted products have less solute per amount of solution. So example, large containers of ready-made juice. So like your orange juice you buy in the store, it already has the water mixed into it. But the big thing about this, it requires way more packaging. So there's a lot more waste from this. Now, waste products as a whole, so with the hustle and bustle of everyday life, there are greater need for prepackaged and ready-made foods. This means that there are less and less foods that are consumed naturally and more and more foods that are consumed which, which have been produced and manufactured by humans. And this, this is a direct relation of this production and manufacturing is the waste products that are created. So, I mean, we're not taking things that are grown right from the farm or from our gardens, we're buying them from a store. And this is really prevalent in diluted solutions versus concentrated. I mean, as I just said in the previous slide, diluted requires smaller packaging, so you don't have as much waste. Or sorry, concentrated requires smaller packaging compared to the diluted. Now, every day, each person in Canada throws out about 2.2 kg, kgs of trash or kilograms of trash. And this is enough to fill about 10,000 garbage trucks. So there's a lot of garbage that we create. Okay, this graph here just kind of shows food waste through the, through the chain and we can see here when we get home there's a lot of food waste a lot of things that are being wasted from these different product from the production and from the use that we have at home okay the next one shows the frozen packaging by demand we can see that we have a lot of things in boxes a lot of things in bags and i mean so we're we're consuming a lot of products that require packaging that's creating a lot, a lot of waste, especially these boxes and bags. Now, hopefully these bags are made out of recyclable plastic and along with these boxes. Okay, this picture here kind of shows what's recyclable and what's not. We're getting close to 50% or well, 44% of materials we use for packaging and diluted and concentrated products along with other things that are recyclable. Some are combustible are compostable, sorry, not combustible, they don't blow up, so compostable, they break down. But we still have 23% of non-recyclable products, so re non-recyclable plastic, rubber, leather, textiles, and other things, which I mean still 23% of our packaging, and you think about how much we consume in, a day, in our daily lives, that re that's a lot of waste that we have to put somewhere that's not good for the environment. And this waste is a, a contributing factor to when we're going to get into talking about acids and bases and the recreation of acid rain and the pollutants that are in our atmosphere. And then this here just shows what's in our garbage, you know, paper 29.4%, wood, yard debris, metals, textiles, plastic. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that hopefully this paper can be mostly recyclable, but some of it's not, and some of it's not put in the necessary recyclable containers. Okay, and this last shows the recycling benefits for 2011. So we have this here, there's a 152,000 mature trees. So this represents enough saved timber resources to produce more than 1.3 billion sheets of newspaper. So we talk about electricity here, the cubic yardage, yards 
of landfill yard space. So this represents enough airspace to fulfill the municipal waste disposal needs for a community of 20,000 Americans for one year. Okay, we have gallons of water. So we recycle 4,447 tons of waste paper, metals, and plastics for the year 2011. The recycling of this quantity of packaging and raw materials avoids their manufacturing disposal, thereby conserving okay, our, our natural environment, our natural ecosystems, and our atmosphere. So, I mean, we are recycling, practices are becoming better. So, that's it for the lesson today. I uh, hope you're able to learn something about soluble products and solutions and insoluble and dilution. And uh, we'll talk to you later. Thanks.